Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Olivia Pearson is the best of mates, and we have had a long and involved ongoing discussion about world politics, religion, and everything else for years. We both appear on Paul's political panel, and we've both been blogging for about 20 years. So time to get serious, I think. I've often said to her that we need to record these discussions. So hey, what better way to do that than by having her on the show? Olivia joins me now. Excellent. Well, it's been a long time since you've been on The Crunch, Olivia. Um, we, we usually you know, go head to head on the political panel with Paul Brennan, but you're back on The Crunch. and yep. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. We'll have no <laughs> pesky liberal interludes coming in on the side. <laughs> we can make it if we try. A <laughs> couple of conservatives. Yeah. So what do you want right. to talk about today? Well, I guess the big one is the Trump, what's happened to our amazing, well, the world's president, the world's most loved president. I'm calling him that now because uh, he's not just America's president because his, the love for that man is worldwide. It's really quite formidable. Are you okay with me talking about this straight away? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was reading something interesting the other day uh, you know, on a website that's run by a few what I would have described as Democrats. And in fact, I think they are registered Democrats. And some of the quotes that they've gone and got from people off the street are amazing and has re- been a re- real vault face uh, or turnaround yeah. on pe- people on the street who, who have listened to the narrative of the media and the Biden uh, regime that Trump is this evil person who is the enemy of democracy. And people are starting to realize that, you know, the very things that the Democrats and the media accuse Trump of, they're guilty of. Every time, every time. It's really, it's amazing to watch. Um, <clears throat> they've always wanted to attach the uh, term felon, mm. haven't they, to Trump? And this is how they've finally done it uh, through another witch hunt and another kangaroo court trial. Um, remember, this is the, about the eighth attempt to get him on a felony charge. Mm. Um, it's lawfare, isn't it? Oh, totally lawfare. But his whole presidency was dogged by the Russia collusion hoax, as we know, uh, which was you know literally made up by Hillary Clinton and her hench people. Um, And then the end of his presidency was dogged by the January 6th persecution, which was, I would say, that was truly an obvious false flag event to make Mm. Trump look as if he tried to pull pull off a coup, um, which was absolute nonsense. Yeah, I don't normally like using the term false flag because it makes you sort of sound crazy and, and, and weird. But I have to agree with you on that, with the involvement of the FBI, with the involvement of all of these um, actors, uh, who were involved, you know, for negative reasons. Yeah. Uh, and people who have never been prosecuted who are actually egging things on and were working for the FBI at the time or um, various other government agencies. You, you do have to come to the conclusion that January 6th was a false flag event where innocent people were duped into participating in what they called an insurrection, which, of course, it wasn't. It wasn't an insurrection. And what about the pipe bombs? Remember that story? Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the bricks and all of the pallets of stuff flying around and things like that. And the people who have gone to prison and are still there without a trial. Yeah. You know, that's unbelievable. So this is where we're at. Well, that's where America's at at the moment with this absolute um, Soviet-style persecution of conservatives, basically. Um, so anyway, now we have this um, in the in the remember in the January sixth prosecution as well persecution um, yeah. that th- there was no rebuttal permitted in that trial. It was just Liz Cheney and little pencil neck Adam Schiff presiding over the whole thing, and no rebuttal was permitted. I mean that is not the American system of law. No. So so it absolutely was a total show trial. And now we've had this. Um, So I think the persecution is really obvious, and I think that it has managed to disgust the American people. Uh, Even those who hated Trump 
until now are now planning on voting him in droves. They're, they're actually flipping, as you were alluding to before. Um, the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's uh, prosecution of the former president has a very strange context of how it even came about. Mm. Um, I'll just go into that a little bit. A guy called Matthew Colangelo was a lead prosecutor in the case. And in December 2022, Colangelo left the Biden Department of Justice. So he was the third highest ranking official in the DOJ, in Biden's DOJ. And he was put on to be acting associate attorney general with his role made clear that... Um, in, in the state of New York. In the state of New York, in the Manhattan DA, uh, op, Manhattan DA's office. And his whole involvement was just, you know, to criminally target Trump. Um, and that's what he did. And then um, Bragg's predecessor, a guy called Siren Vance, Cyrus Vance, arranged for a formal federal prosecutor called Mark Pomerantz, who had gone back to private practice. So here's this guy just practicing private law again. But he was brought in to be special assistant district attorney for the Manhattan DA's office also. Um, and he was there to solely work on the Trump investigation during a temporary leave of absence from his private practice, which is called Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton and Garrison. Mm. But the case was so weak and so cobbled together that even Alvin Bragg decided to shelve it after several lead prosecutors actually quit because they were concerned that the whole investigation was without any clear evidence to support the possible charges. So knowing it was so legally sceptical, Bragg, um, had all but given up on it and had announced that to his colleagues. And then this guy, Mark Pomerantz, did a big huffy resignation as special assistant district attorney for the Manhattan DA. And his resignation letter was then link, leaked to the New York Times. I don't know if you remember this, but um, it's going back a little bit now. And then, as we know, um, they got the whole lawfare process up and running again after that was leaked and <clears throat> got Bragg to do another whole round of this lawfare mm. and run, and they put it up on steroids, really, knowing that time was of the essence because the upcoming election. So really, the whole investigation was taken over by prosecutors from one private law firm who were completely in the tank for Biden and they wanted Trump gone. Um, and that was Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton and Garrison working in conjunction with Matthew Colangelo, who had been Biden's acting associate um, attorney general. So that is the thing that links it undeniably to the Biden administration. I, I noticed the Herald publishes uh, stories about the Trump trial and, and they say, you know, uh, saying that, that, that Trump is saying that this is linked to the Biden uh, administration. And then they put without any foundation or evidence. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, this is evidence for that. And um, I believe they're going to launch a campaign into the whole way it was conducted. So I think this will all come out. But um, then we get to the trial itself. And remember that in order to prove the case, they needed to prove two things beyond a reasonable doubt. One was that Donald Trump, with, uh, with an intent to defraud, made or caused to be made a false entry in a best business record. And two, that he did so with an intent to commit or conceal another crime, which is the so-called election interference in the 2016 election eight years ago. But hang on a second. Weren't these payments made in 2017, the year after the election? Well, that's what the record shows. <laughs> I know. So Stormy Daniels always claimed that um, in 2016, before the election, she had to sign this um, non-disclosure uh, document. But the records that have come out um, about what they got Trump on, yeah, nothing nothing is shown there until 2017. So that's very fuzzy and shonky right there. But so the whole case revolved around the fact that the state had to prove that there was, in fact, a false entry in Trump's business records. And to do that, they used Michael Cohen, already convicted as a liar, as we know, um, to say there was a false entry. And the non-disclosure... Um, document money to Stormy Daniels was entered as a legal expense. And that is exactly what the non-disclosure agreement was with Stormy Daniels. It was a legal mm. expense for Trump. Mm. So it's so this is where it's so badly cobbled together. 
Um, the prosecution's insinuation that the legal expense entry was fraudulent relies upon a misreading of the law, and that's that a political candidate must reveal an extortion attempt against them or else be charged with unlawfully entering um, with an election, interfering with an election. So Stormy Daniels was never accused of extortion by anybody. Trump never ex- accused her of extortion. Well, Stormy Daniels is on record denying multiple times that an affair ever happened, uh, yeah. even as recently as 2016, yeah. uh, saying this was all made up and it's not true. She said uh, he conducted himself like a perfect gentleman. Yeah. And, and now all of a no sudden affair. she she produces this lurid um, uh, explanation of what went on. Yeah. Um, and it's all a fantasy. But that's how they got them him on these two crimes. and. I know you've probably seen this. The 34 counts are incredible in light of what they actually are. Um, 11 invoices for legal services, each one counting as one of the 34 counts. 11 checks paid, each one counting as one of the 34 counts. And 12 ledger entries, each one counting as one of the 34 counts. Ridiculous. Yeah. So that's how they've broken this out. To It's like they've turned the law inside out and upside down and then bolted on. Um, you know, the thing is, is they're trying to say that he was trying to commit a felony uh, in rigging the 2016 election, which, of course, is what Hillary Clinton tried yeah, to do with, the, with, exactly. the, with the Steele dossier. Of course, she's not prosecuted at all um, for that. It's like the records uh, the records case. Yeah. You know, Trump's prosecuted when Hillary Clinton actually uh, destroyed uh, records that she was um, supposed emails. to keep. Yeah, emails, had her yep. own private server, uh, all of that sort of stuff um, yep, was going wiped on. Wiped it with bleach bit. The very things that the Democrats accuse Trump of, they actually do. That's exactly it. And, I mean, there was nothing fraudulent about paying Stormy Daniels for an NDA. That's 100% lawful. Where they got him was on the term legal expenses. Mm. And the judge in the heavily propagandized jury called that fraudulent. I mean, it's so absurd. Um, and NDA, as I said, was is, is money for a legal expense and was done through Trump's lawyer, the lying, dastardly Michael Cohen, who's got a, as you would say, Cam, he's got a face you want to punch all day. Well, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is, is that, again, the Herald wrote about the trial. Uh, I was reading an, an article on Tuesday, and it said, um, you know, Trump didn't call his um, chief financial officer. Of course, the reason why he didn't call him is that um, he's not a believable witness because um, he's um, being convicted of perjury. And I'm sitting there thinking, are you even, you know, reading this? Yeah. Are you, it's not even making sense. The Trump is convicted on the basis of the testimony of a convicted perjurer yeah. himself. Yeah, lied to Congress. Lied to Congress, convicted of it, sent to jail. Sent to jail. Right. So, and the other thing too is they keep using the term hush money, which makes it sound dramatic and surreptitious. Um, Hillary Clinton used campaign funds to pay for the Steele dossier, all made up. The whole thing was made up and used a Russian spy to say that Trump was a Russian spy. She used campaign funds to pay for all this and then wrote them off as legal expenses. I mean, behold the double standard. It's just, you know. Is this a case, um, Olivia, where? The United States is being manipulated by offshore players who want to keep the United States weak and fighting against themselves in almost a civil war. Um, because if the United States focused on things properly, from particularly from a foreign policy perspective, then things might not go so swimmingly. Yeah, I mean, they want to, they would. There are many forces within that country itself, I mean, never mind outside, but in it that would like to see the Constitution not apply anymore. And this is going a long way toward that Constitution being weakened. I mean, it's frankly un-American what's happened to Trump. And everybody knows it. They all know it, but they don't care. Well, Well, the voters care, but the people that have done this don't. The other, the other odd thing is that Stormy Daniels was paid to be quiet, and that's all in that's all the agreement required from her. Yet she went out of her way to make statements, both written and verbal, that you just alluded to, that she had never actually had a sexual encounter with Trump. But because people believed that she had, because she'd previously claimed that when she had 
um, had Michael Avenatti as her lawyer, the crooked lawyer who's now serving 14 he's years in embezzlement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I believe she lied at first, then went over and above what her NDA was about. Um, that's weird to say nothing of unreliable. And, yeah, Michael Cohen served in prison for tax fraud campaign violations and lying to to Congress. And I mean, he did that to shorten his sentence because the Mueller investigation over the Rus Russian hoax got to him, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the thing, right? But they're they completely unreliable, both of them. They accused Trump of colluding with Russia. It, it looks from where I'm looking at it from that the people that were colluding with Russia were actually Democrats. Of course. And of course, then you've got Biden. I remember the first impeachment of Trump um, over a telephone call. Uh, that he made uh, to somebody in Ukraine. To Zelensky. To Zelensky. And yeah. they said, oh, this is terrible. We're going to impeach you for that. Yeah. But, but Biden had actually strong-armed the Ukrainian government to replace a prosecutor whilst his son was involved in a company that was there. Yeah, in the, in the gas company. And he, he, again, they accused Trump of something that didn't happen. Yeah. But ignored the fact that Biden actually did do yeah, what they accused Trump of doing it when, with regards to Ukraine. It's so shamelessly brazen and and in our faces. And all I can hope is that this just has won Trump the election because nobody wants to see a candidate treated this way. Nobody, you know, no, not if they've got a, a semblance of a fair mind left, you know. So did, did you know the other thing, Cam? I'm not sure if you've caught up with this one, but it came out in April that um, Benny Thompson, who's a crazy Democrat rep and a ranking member of the Committee on Homeland Security, he introduced a bill in, in April of this year to terminate United States Secret Service protection for felons. But precisely because if Trump gets sentenced to jail, then he won't have protection, um, protection in jail. <laughs> yeah. And and even even if he doesn't go to jail, it's so that they can make the Secret Service not to protect him. It's called the Disgraced Former Protectees Act. So they obviously want to kill him too, uh, whether or not he goes to prison. So these people are sick with hate to their very very cause. It, it it's astonishing because, you know, I I uh, look at Elon Musk right. Which just to digress slightly, look at Elon Musk who said I'm going to take over Twitter and then said about doing it. The media and everybody <laughs> said it'll fail, it'll fall over. <laughs> it, he got rid of two-thirds of the staff. It's running better than ever. Yeah. He removed all of the restrictions, the government interference, and, of course, released all the files via you know Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberg um, on the Twitter files that showed that the US government was breaching their own constitution in silencing people on the platform. And then, of course, you've got... Uh, the attack on Elon Musk and Twitter in Australia from the e-safety commissioner. Yep. And I'm starting to wonder if the people that threaten uh, control or threaten the control of some elite group, I don't know who, I mean, it sounds crazy, but this is where I'm getting to. People who stand for freedom are attacked on all fronts, and you look at the battle that Elon Musk is having now with various governments, you've got the dodgy little French and the EU trying to control. They're not touching Facebook. They're not touching Google. They're not touching YouTube. No, they're going they're... after the one guy that actually stands for freedom of speech. Yeah, that's And they're right. going after, uh, after Donald Trump, who there were no wars when Donald Trump was the president. No, that's right. Right? He, no. he, he cut deals. No, I mean, there's a reason. You know, we can now flick. A uh, nice little segue there into having a look at the situation in the Middle East, because you know Hamas attacked Israel uh, in the most appalling way. Oh, barbaric! Uh, barbaric, evil way that cruel. they did it. Uh, cruel, vicious. Uh, Israel smacked back, and Hamas thought that the entire Arab world would rise up and support them. Mm. Strangely, they haven't. I mean, they've done a few things. They're meddling in the UN and the WHO and places like that. But by yeah. and large, they've stayed silent. And and I actually credit Donald Trump for that because of the Abraham Accords that he signed with the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Egypt and all of that brought all, all right. of them into, into that 
peace agreement with Israel, and that's holding still, even after almost a year of violence in the Middle East. And yeah. nobody has come to the aid, apart from Iran, of course, who funded it and orchestrated it and and arranged it all. Um, nobody's come to the aid of the Palestinians. No, they haven't, and they probably won't. In fact, there are suggestions. I mean, Biden keeps threatening to bring a lot of them over to America <laughs> to add to the immigrant population. You can imagine how excited Americans are about that prospect? Not. <laughs> but, yeah, the Abraham Accords have held, um, and that's great to see. But there's still a long ways to go, I think, mm. um, with this whole war. Um, I noticed that... Um, They've just found four more dead hostages, one of them in a, a British Israeli mm. um, and the, the other old guys. So that's another four. And they believe that there's probably only 85 alive yeah. now out of the original 260-odd. Hamas probably doesn't want to release them because of the horrific injuries. Yeah. The, I mean, <laughs> Israeli intelligence is pretty good, but they know that there's at least 45 other ones that are dead. Yeah. So, I mean, those bodies are just sitting there decomposing. Well, it, and some it, of those that's part of the psychological warfare of yeah. Hamas, though, right? Because yeah. under, under Jewish law, um, unless you've got a body, you don't have a death, right? And, and then if you do have a death, you have to bury them within a week. Well, see, this is, this is where I feel so sorry for Netanyahu at the moment because um, – the pressures on mm. that man are just unbelievable. Um, the pressures of living in a democracy where people who have got family members who are hostages or dead, um, unknown, uh, who are able to protest uh, freely outside the house of the prime minister um, and and bring that pressure yeah. to, to cut a deal, any deal, please make it all in so we can get our loved ones back. And I understand, look, if I was in that position, I'd be doing the same thing. Yeah, we'd right. all want that. Yeah, we'd all want that, right? But Netanyahu, well, Israel has made a decision. We're not having this happen again. Like that, their their slogan is "Never again" is right now. Well, Netanyahu, uh, at the moment, from what I've read today, he's feeling that pressure quite badly because he's got the the guys to his right, Ben Gavir, um, the national security minister, and also the other guy, I've forgotten, Smotrich. Yeah, Smotrich, yep. Yeah, the financial minister. Um, you know, they're threatening to overturn his coalition um, because they absolutely want the war to carry on until Hamas is completely eliminated. That's that's the mission. Um, and a ceasefire just to get the hostages back without the war being completed for them is abject failure. So Netanyahu is caught between the families of the hostages and, of course, the more right-wing. I mean, in the old days, the standard position was that you don't negotiate with terrorists. That was the Western position as well. Yeah, never negotiate with terrorists because yeah, it so, encourages them. So Ben Gavir and Smotrich are um, actually still trying to hold to that um, because – I mean, Hamas are not. There's nothing honourable in their in their in their natures at all. Israel could abide by all of the rules of any kind of peace deal, and you know that within a week, Hamas will break it again. You know what astonishes me about about this conflict, right? If you believe the protesters that there's genocide happening, right? And and you and I both agree on this. It's just not right. If if it was genocide, the Israelis are very bad at doing it. You know, and they've got the firepower yeah. to to be able to to cause far more. But but let's say that it is happening, and there's terrible things happening, and in a war, terrible things do happen. Answer me this: Why does Hamas have to create fake videos of injured children and people being wounded, and supposedly innocent people being shot by Israeli snipers, and even though they're wriggling and moving and they're not dead at all? Why do they need to do that? Surely there is literally acres of dead bodies that they can film doing this. Why do they have fake ones? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Well, we we know they do that because um, to win the sympathy of the Western world, well, the whole world. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of acting that goes on because they get caught in the act all the time, don't they? Yeah, it's like um, Mr. Fafo, uh, F-A-F-O. You can Google that if you 
listening, but um, he's a, a crisis actor that they use. He's been a, a radiologist. He's been a father looking after a injured child. He's been injured himself several times. He's been a tour guide. I know the um, one you mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, he's guy. been a dead body even. Um, yeah. Amazingly. He's, he's been paid a lot, hasn't he? <laughs> amazingly, here, there he was in the white shrouds that they were the knot tied at their head, um, sitting up on a hospital gurney texting whilst he's <laughs> supposed, <laughs> supposed to be dead. <laughs> yeah. I, saw, I saw another one the other day of two, two teenagers that were sitting in the back with a body and they were trying to cry, but they kept bursting out laughing. And then yes, the body sat that. up. You saw yeah. that one? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's just absurd. But interesting that um, Smotrich said on Monday, Bezalel Smotrich said that um, agreeing to a ceasefire would amount to a humiliation of Israel and a surrender. Um, increased military pressure, he said, is the only language understood in the Middle East. And he's right. That he's is the only language right. these terrorist dogs of war understand. Yeah, I can remember when I did a visit to Israel and I was standing uh, on Mount Bental in the Golan Heights. And Golan Heights, people won't, probably don't understand, it was taken from Syria in the Six-Day War. Just like the West Bank. <laughs> and, 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 and annexed. Um, and they'll never give it back. And when you're on uh, up on the Golan Heights, there's a series of mountains. They're actually extinct volcanoes. So Mount Bental is an extinct volcano. There's another mountain over to the side, which is a huge military base on it. And we had this uh, colonel come over who was in charge of that sector and to give us a discussion. And we're standing there at Mount Bental. And it, it's, uh, it's kind of, the Israelis are funny, you know, in many respects. There's a cafe on top of Mount Bental, <laughs> and it, it's called Coffee Anan. <laughs> right. uh, to, to play on the on the former uh, UN mean, Secretary General yeah. Coffee Anan, right? So anyway, we're standing there, and this colonel was standing on the on this parapet, um, but there's a set of Syrian trenches that have been um, preserved. So people, it's a tourist thing, but in front of it, there's still signs saying minefields and. And, you know, there's barbed wire and things like that. And I, I asked the king, I said, why, why haven't you cleared the minefields? And he said, well, sometime in the future, someone on the other side of that fence is going to have a rush of shit to the brains and, <laughs> and want to attack us, and they may as well crawl through their own minefields um, to, <laughs> t to do it. But while we were standing there talking, there was um, some shelling going on between Assad's forces and the Free Syrian Army at that stage was 2014. So the Free Syrian Army was there, and they were shelling each other 900 yards away from where we're standing. And if you've never experienced artillery fire before, it can be quite frightening. Very loud. Right? And um, this colonel didn't even blink an eye. It's boom, boom going on in the background. And I said, oh, I've got a question. He said, well, what's that? And I said, do they ever fire this way? He said, oh, not often. I said, why? What happens? He says, they die. Yeah. You know, he says, see that base over there? That's got a whole lot of radars and everything on it. See that base over there on that hill? That's got radars on it. When they fire an artillery shell, the radars find out where it was fired from. And then we have two batteries that are hidden behind the, the hills, and they just fire at that spot that our computers have decided where they were, and they cease to exist. Wow. But, you know, he was telling me that, at the moment, Assad was, even though he's fighting a civil war, was in control, and he's too smart to invade Israel because he knows what will happen. Mm. And and literally, Israel is the embodiment of peace through superior firepower, particularly with Egypt and Jordan and Syria. It's only the nutters in Lebanon um, and, and the Palestinians that want to keep on fighting a fight they can never win. But that's what they did in Yom Kippur, remember? Um, yeah. That's why the intelligence failed, because they they assumed Sadat, who was the Egyptian prime minister at the time, the president, that he would never start a war with Israel, that they knew, he knew he could never win, but he did. Yeah, well, and, that, and that's what this Hamas attack was, was an intelligence failure. Mm. Um, that's the way I read it, That for because basically four years before it, there's been nothing. I keep thinking every um, August and September, I will uh, they'll fire up again, and and we'll have a three or four months of 
rocket barrages, but it's been really quiet for four months. And I was thinking to myself, well, something's wrong here. There and, was a calm, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a calm. and so I think the Israelis were hoodwinked into the, the human intelligence failed them. They were being lied to, obviously. Yeah. Um, their electronic intelligence wasn't picking up the signals that they should have been picking up. And Hamas were gearing up for a massive attack. And it caught them unawares, but once the Israeli military started to grind into action, um, it was only going to go one way after that. Yeah, they'll have to litigate it later over what that breach of intelligence was. Um, but I also know that um, you probably know too that uh, because of the unpopularity of aspects of Netanyahu's government and his um, all those protests that were happening over his uh, trying to limit the reach of the Supreme Court, um, because the the courts can be suffer from corruption a little yeah. bit like they have in America with what Trump's and dealing here. with. Um, people were threatening mutiny from deep within the intelligence community and, mm. and basically not turning up to work and threatening not to turn up to work. And they were the people responsible for the surveillance. And, you know, that those arguments were very vicious in the Israeli cabinet because they know if you've got people that aren't doing the surveillance properly, they you can they get a die. Yeah, so it will need to be, um, there will be an investigation finally, um, just like there was with Golda Meir. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. But speaking of Golan Heights and uh, disputed territory and the West Bank especially, um, it really annoys me that people, that it trots off everybody's tongue that it's occupied territory and it's not. It's disputed territory. Mm. Um, just like Kashmir, just like Cyprus, just like Tibet. You know, Turkey has, Turkey has permanent troops deployed in Cyprus. And the Greek Cypriots absolutely hate it. It's disputed um, and it's ongoing, but very few people care. Same thing with Kashmir. I mean, that's disputed between, what, India, Pakistan and China. For the Kurdish few- regions as well, the Kurd- Kurdish regions of Iraq and uh, Turkey and Syria. Yeah, uh, you're, you know, absolutely. They're all disputed territories. The Kurds say, no, we're autonomous. And all of those governments say, no, you're not. And there's a lot of Ukraine that's now disputed territory, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. Um, but Tibet, people still go on their big adventures and climbing Mount Everest and um, seldom care about the dispute going on. The West Bank, on the other hand, you know, seems to get everyone's knickers in a flipping knot um, because it involves Israel. And technically, it is now Israeli territory anyway after the Six Day War. Um, Jordan made war, Israel responded, won the territory back. Jordan doesn't want it back. That's the thing that people forget, is the West Bank was part of Jordan. And Jordan doesn't want it back. Why don't they want it back? For the same reason that Egypt doesn't want the Gaza Strip back, because the Gaza Strip was Egyptian. Right. right? So Yeah, yeah, totally. Right. It was taken again in the So they don't want it back because it's full of Palestinians. No, this is the thing, right? Nobody complains about the Palestinians in refugee camps in Syria, in Jordan, in Lebanon. In Egypt. Oh, those camps are huge. Right? Yeah. They're huge. They're massive. There are millions of people. Millions. In nobody, nobody sees anything about those. No. They don't say to the Jordanians, well, why don't you let the Palestinians out of the camp? The Jordanians don't want them out of the camp. They know what happens. Um, the same with the Egyptians. You know, they, everyone talks about uh, Israel uh, having this border and it's an open-air prison and all of this, and they forget that one of the borders of Gaza is with Egypt, mm-hmm. and their fence is even bigger than the Israelis' one. Yeah, I know. It's right? People have a very lopsided view of the whole thing. But it's all Israel's fault. You know, never mind that um, Palestinian people could come and get medical help from, from Israel. They could come through the border and work every day. Well, that's all ended. That's the thing that Hamas has done is they have ended that. The Israelis will never let that happen again. No, because, I mean, even remember when um, Israel was trying back, and I'm talking about around 2008, when they were trying to get a two-state solution going, um, you know, after the five other times they'd tried, and Abbas was leader of the party of Fatah, um, he was offered 97% of the West Bank, part of East Jerusalem, and all of Gaza, along with Israeli withdrawal from settlements in the Jordan Valley and eastern Samaria, 
And the offer also included a protected tunnel between Gaza and the West Bank to give Palestinians safe passage between the two territories. Which the Israelis would have built. And paid for. And Abbas refused out of hand. So Israel just after that point was, oh, we're not doing this anymore. And they this ceased is, all this negotiations. Mahmoud Abbas, who's in his 18th year of his four-year term. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not a dictator at all, hey. Right. What's happening in the UK, Olivia? Well, so here's some good news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now for the good news. The Conservatives Farage problem uh, will not fade soon because he has thrown his hat in the ring to lead the Reform Party and also pick up an MP seat in this coming election. Um, and Rishi Sunak is... You know, he thought he had problems before. He's really got them now because that will totally hemorrhage so many votes to the Reform Party. And that, that's what will happen. The Conservatives, the, the Libertarians, um, anybody even on the left that's slightly more conservative, they're going to vote for Nigel Farage. Um, and, of course, the platform that he's running on is um, anti-immigration and also completing Brexit to a standard that would satisfy Nigel Farage. So uh, I've been critical of Farage myself for um, trying to hang up his hat. He's a disruptor who disrupts, and then he hangs up his hat until he the next thing hat. comes along to disrupt. Yeah, and that, that's fine, but but you don't get a result uh, no. often. Uh, but it's interesting, though. I mean, he, he's definitely touching um, the hearts of... Uh, of Britons, because Guido Fawkes tweeted um, that since Farage announced uh, about the Reform Party and and being involved, they're gaining a new member every 4.7 seconds, which David <laughs> Far David Farrer points out is 700 members an hour. Oh, that's beautiful! <laughs> huh? So glad so, to hear that. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, we, we've also seen over over the um, our long weekend um, over King's uh, birthday. Um, a massive counter-protest to the Palestinians taking over the streets of London, haven't we? Yeah, that was mass, tens of thousands, and that was organised by Tommy Robinson, I believe. Mm. So Nigel Farage, one of the reasons I started to really dislike the man was his absolute um, abandoning Tommy Robinson when he went to prison. You know, Farage mm. called him all sorts of names, but Tommy's also always been their staunchest and most consistent fighter against um, the Islamic problem, and they do have an Islamic problem. There's no getting around it. And um, that's touched everyone in Parliament now. Um, if we've, as we've seen, you know, uh, what, 150 MPs resign, and don't tell me that the Islamic problem is not a large part of that hemorrhage. So... Um, I believe that Reform Party was already polling at around 10%. Now that Farage is taking the leadership of it, I really hope he brings Tommy Robinson um, into a, a, a sort of peace accord between the two men um, because they're going to need to stick together if they're going to um, get anywhere, anywhere good, you know, anywhere mm. substantial. So I'm really glad that um, Farage has done this finally um, and decided to throw his hat in the ring. Good good for him. Now we can head back to the United States. Uh, I've mentioned at the start of this interview some of the, co the quotes that I'm seeing from people. And I'll give you one now um, from a guy. Uh, let's just see who he is. He He's 54. He lives in Denver, Colorado yep. uh, with his wife. He used to be the former brand president of Levi Strauss. And <laughs> And they've got a couple of kids, right? He's a stay-at-home dad, and, and he's been a lifelong Democrat who voted for Obama twice and also worked in his campaign, and in 2016 he voted for Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Right? right? So we've got a, a lifelong Democrat. And, and for New Zealand listeners, voters in the United States have to register either independent or Democrat or Republican. So this guy's a registered Democrat, and that means he gets to vote in the caucuses in his state uh, for the selection of candidates, et cetera, right? This is yeah. what he said. This is what he said. Listen to this, Olivia. I don't want to be a Democrat right now, he continued. I don't want to be ruled by experts. I don't want better experts. I want no experts. Trump, 
Trump is just going to try and break stuff and not listen to anything that anyone tells him to do. And I don't think that's necessarily a long-term solution. That's just what we need right now. Mm. Yep. <laughs> you think about that. He wants someone who's a toy thrower to throw his toys out of the cot yeah, and that's then right. smash the cot and break the cot so that they can start again. Well, I thought, I know the, I know the um, article you're talking about in the free press, right? Yeah. Um, and it was very Hardly good. Hardly a right-wing or conservative organisation. I mean, it's run by Barry Weiss, for goodness sake. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I read that. And when, when his – I don't think Trump is going to break things. He's actually going to restore things. But he will take America out of um, stupid things like the Paris Accords, like the WHO – and um, and maybe call the FBI into account, which is long overdue. Mm. Um, so, if I mean, that's not really breaking things. That's, you know, taking them back to an American standard again. It's a sentiment, every- though, isn't it? They're, yeah. They're, people are going to vote for they're, they're going to vote for Trump, even though they're Democrats, because they don't trust the Democrats anymore. Yeah. I I I just think every time I go to Twitter, there are so many people that have watched what's happened to Trump who have all said, I voted Obama twice, I voted Hillary Clinton, I voted Biden, and now they're all watch, They're all saying out loud that they're going to vote for Trump. And they're saying it publicly. That's the other thing, Cam, yeah. is they're open about it because they're so disgusted at the un-American way in which um, this whole administration has worked, Biden's administration, and they, they know it's going to be the end of their country if Trump doesn't get back in. You know, they well, know that. I, I, I've spent, I, I've followed Nate Silver for a number of years. He's a polling expert. He started off uh, actually crunching numbers for baseball games of, you know, in sport. He, um, he had a website called 538. He was bought by ESPN uh, to do um, political um, coverage as well, made a huge impact in the election uh, where Mitt Romney was standing for president. <laughs> and, right. Remember now, it well. Oh, I had a bet with Leighton Smith of News Talk ZB at the time, very public bet um, for a very expensive lunch and, and the loser would pay. That, uh, And I said Mitt Romney wouldn't win and he said Mitt Romney would win. And I was basing all of my assessment on the polling data that Nate Silver was doing. So he he had a model where he aggregated a whole lot of polls, then added in some assumptions and some algorithms and came out with, you know, a, a prediction. And he was right. And it, and it made him famous then. And, you know, he's he's been pretty close to these things. And I've been watching what he's saying about what's going on with Trump. And he came out uh, over the weekend and said, uh, this is really hard to predict, but I'm going to give it a go. And but I'm going to develop a model that takes into account the the public sentiment. And he his assessment was: is everybody knows about all this stuff about Stormy Generals and Trump? No one cares, mm. uh, and it will have uh, not have a negative effect for Trump, but will have a negative effect for the d- Democrats. Well, I I suspect that's entirely right. Because um, just too many Democrats are just too disgusted. I mean, even the guy I call Mephisti, Mep- Mephisto, Mephistopheles, you know, the guy yes. Carver, Carvel, James Carvel, who was the um, campaign manager for so many Democrat elections, going right back to Bill Clinton. Um, you know, he is having a meltdown all the time because he realizes how deeply they are losing this election with the, just having Biden as a candidate because he's so useless and demented and um, robotic. And also, I mean, these people hate Trump with a passion, but they can see that they're losing their own Democratic voters over it. And I mean, I just hope it pans out. What will they do next, Cam? Well, if they can do that, they'll do anything. Yeah, I mean, you look at what they that. have. Look, at, you don't. You don't need to look at what they will do. Just look at what they have done. Well, the only thing left to them is to kill him. Well, they they tried to do that with the FBI raid on um, Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, they sure did. They you know, sure did. And they made up their you know excuse on that one there too, because they they actually had plans for if there was a gunfight with the Secret Service. 
right? The FBI had plans to have a gunfight with another uh, intelligence or protection organization, law enforcement organization. <laughs> Unbelievable. If, yeah. All right. Yeah. If that right there is a reason for widespread sackings at the FBI and uh, and and rejigging of it. Yeah. Well, that's why they're going to have to clean up the FBI because I feel really sorry for anybody that is honourable within that institution and still actually believes in America. You know, imagine being that person in the FBI right now. Mm, totally. Yeah. Well, we're just about out of time, Olivia, but we've got a little bit of an announcement to make, haven't we? Yeah. I'll allow you to do that one, Cam. Well, uh, I thought we'd have this interview to give people a little bit of a taste of what you're decided to call the Pearson perspective. Yes, I wonder where I got that from. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of the Perigo perspective. Now there's going to be the Pearson perspective. Yeah, I like the alliterative uh, aspect of that. But, mm. uh, you know, Olivia, you and I have had debates about politics for, it's got to be 20 years, you know, back when we were blogging and, and having arguments and going to the, um, bloggers drinks at, bloggers at, drinks Gal, at, at Galbraith and wind, winding up the lefties and making them all <laughs> froth just for, <laughs> for fun. You know, we've been on TV shows together. We famously made Phil Gifford lose his rag and quit the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had a ball over 20 years, and uh, and so we thought, well, let's bring that to the crunch and have a regular slot where we get to hear Olivia's uh perspectives on anything. Uh, but it'll but probably be a lot about politics, eh? Yeah, totally. Um, politics and culture, um, we can always comment on both. But, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to do that with you, Cam. I re I'm really looking forward to it. And um, and you and I can have Donny Brooks as well, and it's all okay. Yeah, <laughs> Cause we're, because it's an intellectual discussion with us, not a personal discussion. Yeah, and that's how it should be. So, no, I look forward to the first Pearson's perspective and I hope that our listeners, your listeners. Um, our listeners. Our listeners uh, like it as well and look forward to it every – how often, Cam, are we going to do this? Oh, I don't know. We'll have to check with our um, you know, supervisors, those <laughs> in charge. You like to call them the overladies. The overladies. They're lovely, actually. <laughs> our lovely overladies. Yeah, we'll check with them, but we'll make it a regular thing anyway, um, maybe every fortnight or something like that. Well, it's going to be fun. We've got a UK election, we've got an American election, and we've got chaos and carnage all around the world on various different cultural and political things. There's plenty to talk about, and it just, you know, I think it's going to be fantastic. Okay, thanks, Cam. Look forward right. to it. Thank you very much for coming on The Crunch, Olivia. Thanks for having me. Talk soon. Olivia's international perspective is second to none. There is no one else in New Zealand media landscape with her knowledge, education, or ability to crunch complex geopolitical issues into bite-sized chunks. Now we're going to have her insights more regularly with the Pearson perspective as a regular feature on the crunch. Let me know your thoughts by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.